Okay, Revelation 22, verse 1. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So there's a picture he's given us here of the throne of God, the lamb. There's a river of life coming out. You know, Jesus promised that woman that the water he had to give would let her never thirst again. It comes from the throne of God. There is a river that makes glad the city of God. You ever heard that before? This is it. It's right here. One day you will stand there and look at it. And on either side, there'll be the tree of life. And we haven't really heard much about the tree of life since Adam and Eve blew it back in the Garden of Eden. And the Lord didn't want them to eat of that tree and live forever in a fallen state. And now he's brought us full circle. He took us from Genesis to Revelation where we lost access to the tree of life, and now he says it's here, right here by the river of God, right here where it brings forth fruit, 12 different, every month out of the year, you know? It's like, what do we got in January? What is it? What's in February? What's coming next month? You know, there's just this neat thing going on, yielding its fruit each month, 12 kinds of fruit. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So we saw in the last chapter that that water of life had to do with salvation. It flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Tree of life on either side, 12 kinds of fruit. Revelation 2, 7. He who has an ear. When, when the Lord first began this book, he was writing to these seven churches. And to each one, he was encouraging them to endure and to stand and to some he rebuked other there was a there was there was some that he didn't have to rebuke them but many of them he did but to each one he said if you have an ear hear what the spirit is saying to the church and to this particular church he said he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who conquers and, and Jesus mentioned that in the last chapter too if you remember he wants us to conquer he wants us to be victorious in our walk with him. You know, I, I get, I get, I don't want to say, I don't even know the attitude I get when I find Christians that just can't seem to get the victories. Like, the Lord has given us everything we need to be victorious in him. And, I, and it's not like you want to put people down for that, but tap into what he has provided. Everything we need to conquer in him. And Jesus said, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Don't you want some of that? Which is in the paradise of God. Genesis 2.9. Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. It was there at the beginning. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was also there, and a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. Now that river flows out of the throne of God. God did not want man to live in a fallen state forever. And so when man partook of the knowledge of good and evil, the Lord basically cast him out of the garden of Eden and barred his way, it says in verse 24, Genesis 3, 24, he drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And, and I think he's saying God does not want man to live in this fallen state forever. There was, a, there was a plan of redemption that man fell. Jesus said he would be the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. A man lost access to that dwelling with God as he desired in the garden, that place where he could walk with God and talk with God and partake of all these trees, even the tree of life. And then when man fell and sin became the death that, that passed on from Adam to all of us, when man fell, the Lord said, you can't partake of the tree of life, and he barred him from this, put him out of the garden, and it's been gone. We, haven't, we don't see it. It's nowhere 
Look all, all around the world, you'll never find the tree of life because it's up, it's in heaven. It's, it's in this new city, wherever that is, wherever he is. You won't find it on the earth. Revelation 22, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have a right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates. What can I tell you, brothers, sisters? Wash your robes. No dirty clothes in there. Revelation 22, if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life. So you want to be careful how you treat the book of Revelation. You know, there's a great promise to those who read it and walk in it. A blessing, he says. But there's also a, a kind of a big downfall if you take away from the words. God will take away his share in the tree of life. I don't even know what that means, but I don't want to have that happen to me. Wouldn't it be a bummer to be standing there by that river, looking at that tree and seeing like Rachel go and take a bite out of it and say, I'd like to have a bite of that. <laughs> I'm sorry I have barred you from the tree of life. <laughs> oh, boy. Why is that, Lord? Well, because you took away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Okay, well, I'm going to start crying now. Then you wipe away your tears. The leaves were for the healing of the nations. Healing is a neat Greek word. Sounds, sounds almost like therapy, doesn't it? Therapia. It means attendance, like someone who is like a servant giving attendance, or a, a, a man who's like a, a servant of a household, watching over, attending. It actually has a medical connotation or the idea of cure. And uh, here's some places where that word is used in the New Testament. Who is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household? That's, that's that word, healing. It's kind of an interesting one. You know, again, it's this idea that you have this, this uh, servant who's there kind of managing the people, giving them their food at the proper time, you know. This healing for the nations, you know, I don't know exactly what that's even talking about, you know, whether when, when people go to heaven, what kind of healing we will need. You know, maybe it is uh, just a healing of our sorrows and our pain and our crying. He says he will wipe away the tears from our eyes. There's something there. I don't know if it's, you know, exactly what that healing is, but there's healing in this tree of life. But when you look at how the word is used, maybe it has more to do with his attending of us, you know, giving us food at the proper time and just watching over us and that kind of a thing for healing. Luke 9, 11, when the crowds learned that they followed him, he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and he cured those who had need of healing. And there again in Luke 12, it's the idea of this uh, faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household to give their portion of food at the proper time. So you have this picture of you know, uh, somebody who's watching over to give us what we need, the healing of the nations. What is it that we need right now, Lord? Touch our lives, help us. You know, we, we often wonder, what's it gonna be like in heaven? You know, people get this picture of floating on a cloud, playing a harp, and you're thinking, who wants to do that? I don't, I don't know, I mean, the Lord's gonna have so much, we're gonna be there forever. And it's going to be awesome. I mean, we're, we're not going to sit here and wonder, what am I going to do with all my free time? You're going to have such an awesome time. But the Lord is going to be there himself, ministering and caring and touching. And I don't know, it's just, it's something to think about. The word is taken from a root word, which means to wait upon, like that servant, to wait upon somebody, menially, and also to adore God, specifically to relieve somebody of a disease, to cure them, to heal, and to worship. So it's an interesting word in the Greek language. You know, sometimes when you try to understand like the nuances of a, of a word in the, in the Bible, 
it's, it's important to look at how it's used elsewhere and maybe some of the root words. And it doesn't give you necessarily an exact meaning in a particular scripture, but it, it does give you the nuance behind a word. And it, to me, I just wrote down in that bold there, it's interesting that at this time the tree of life is opened again to mankind. It is for healing. And somehow this word is linked to the root word which has to do with worship. Or, you know, waiting upon God or this servant, this servant heart. So, you know, take it for what you want. Pray about it. Ask the Lord to give you insight around there. Here's an amazing scripture to me in Luke 12, verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. You know, Jesus is talking about himself here. And I imagine some of us may be like Peter in that moment. Lord, I don't want you washing my feet. He wants to do this. He wants to serve us. He wants to wash the feet. He wants to wrap himself. Yes, there will be the worship of Jesus. And we'll be standing there in awe. The, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, all that will be there. But there's, there's this part. He... He wants to be involved with us. You know, Revelation 21, he will wipe away every tear. I mean, you can see there, there's involvement. There's, you know, care. And, and even though there may be millions and millions of people there, he, it's not like he's overwhelmed. He can come. I mean, we, it's not like we don't have the time, right? He, he can come to you a thousand years from now, Gordon, and spend some time over there. But he's, he's there caring, watching. And maybe, maybe he can do it with all of us. Simultaneously, I don't know what he can do. He can do anything he wants to do. <laughs> but I suppose on that day, I'm going to have some tears. And I would love it. If for him who understands me more than anybody, loves me more than anybody, would walk over to me and say, let me, let me wipe those away. You know, I'm going to say, thank you, Jesus. You know, what else can I say? Let me serve you. Sit down at my table. And we're going to be sitting there thinking, man, I'm, I'm a, such a sinner. I was such a, you know, wicked person. Lord, look what you've done. And I'm going to be like, wipe these tears again. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's, it's this interaction that I see in this chapter where he's saying, come and eat. Come and drink of this river. Come and eat from this tree of life. And come and drink from this river. It says, no longer will there be anything accursed. <clears throat> but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. I mean, get used to worshiping him on the earth here. I mean, I can't imagine. I love it when we, we have worship services. You're, you're around Christian people and you hear the band and you're worshiping. And there's times you can really enter into God's presence. But it, it ain't, I mean, not, it's not, not going to hold a candle to what we will experience here. Get used to it. You know, don't be ashamed to worship Jesus. He's done so much. His servants will worship him. They will see his face. Just like you're looking at one another here tonight. It'll be Jesus. It won't be a picture postcard. It won't be a movie or someone. I never thought he looked like that. You'll see him face to face. I wonder if we'll be surprised. It said he's not beautiful. Some of the pictures I've seen of Jesus look kind of handsome to me. The Bible says he wasn't really that way. Wonder if we'll be surprised. He walks, steps off the throne. We say, "Oh wow! I didn't know. I didn't know you looked like that." <laughs> but you won't be mistaken for his love, and his outreach to you, and his compassion. Kindness makes a man attractive. Kindness makes a man attractive. Translation. It's true. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And I'm telling you, I'm going to be proud to wear it. Write it up there. 
Right on. Would you rather have that or the mark of the beast? <laughs> the night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. Finally, all the accursed things are gone. You know, it took place in the Garden of Eden. Cursed is the ground. We've been living in a cursed world ever since. But there's a day coming when it will be done. We shall see him face to face. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. Right now we are. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Everyone, and here again you have that scripture of having that future hope drives a change in my life. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. 1 Corinthians 13, 9, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, that's Jesus, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, and we do. You know, we do see in a mirror dimly. We, 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 we understand things about him, and there's things we don't understand, like I was sharing Sunday. I mean, it's... It's dim. We're seeing something there. But then, face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. When that, what, what, what's it going to be like when we know him fully? You know, when it talks about how, how wide and how high and how broad and how deep is the love of God, and we can know that. And we can understand the heart of God. We can understand the wisdom of God. And comprehend these things. We, we shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. They will reign forever and ever. It tells us that we reign with Christ for a thousand years during the millennium. And some of the teaching around that, about you know, why some people believe there will be different groups of people there, is they're, they're thinking, well, you've got to have somebody to reign over. But why do we have to have somebody to reign over? We're just reigning with Christ. You know, it says here, we're going to reign with him forever and ever. Does that mean there's going to be people in heaven we're reigning over? No, we, we understand that you may be a ruler over many cities or a ruler over many things, but we're just reigning with Christ. I don't have to necessarily reign over people to be reigning with him. I reign in life through Jesus Christ. If, I, mean, I, I probably need to be just reigning over me. You know, is, is, that's, that's enough of a task. To reign over me rather than reigning over everybody, you know, other people. And so he said uh, to me, these words are trustworthy and true. I like it. He says it again. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. You know, John was a, a great witness. He was a witness who wrote about the story of Jesus in his other book, first uh, book of John, and also in first, second, third John. And now here, he's a faithful witness. I'm the one who saw these things. I'm the one who heard these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel. John had a problem with that, didn't he? Every time he heard something that really was exciting, he would just fall down and worship. <laughs> and he said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant <laughs> with you and your brothers, the prophets, with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. John was just easily touched. And, he, you know, wow, he just falls down and worship. He saw something great. I need to worship this thing. No, just worship God, John. But he seems like an excitable brother, doesn't he? One that the Lord loved. The one who laid his head on his breast at the table, can't wait to meet him. Verse 10, he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy and the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. Behold, I'm coming soon bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he's done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
Blessed are those who wash their robes, so they may have the right to eat of the tree of life, and they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. If anybody ever asks you if there are dogs in heaven, there's a scripture for it. <laughs> it's talking about people there. But it's just a point of discussion. In essence, men choose their eternal destiny. These are words regarding judgment. I'm bringing my recompense. Some may continue on a path of their choice, an evildoer or filthy or righteous or holy. But the bottom line is the end's coming. The end is near. And Jesus draws a big comparison. Those who wash their robes and partake of the tree of life versus those who are outside who don't know the Lord. And so I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. The one who hears say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. And I just put down here, there is a longing in the spirit and hopefully a growing longing in his bride for his coming. You know, there's a, a, a tension, I think, in the heart of God and also in ours, should be in ours, that he says he is holding back till men come to repentance. And while there's a growing longing in our heart for him to come, I hope that it's matched with a growing desire to see people come to know Jesus. May we thirst for him. He closes out, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in the book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life. I mean, we're coming down to the final words in the Bible here. You know what I mean? And he's, he's uh, summing it up around the tree of life, the holy city, the things we just talked about, God dwelling with men. And he's telling you, you don't want to miss out on this. You don't want to miss out on the tree of life. You don't want to miss out on that holy city. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. And so, four last bullet points here. He leaves us with a warning about adding to or taking away from the words of the prophecy. He leaves us with a promise of his coming. He said, surely I'm coming soon. Don't ever lose sight of that. That's something Jesus promised. I'm coming again. And even though there are mockers in these last days who will say, where is the promise of his coming? Don't let that heart invade your mind and your heart. He's coming. He leaves us with a cry that should ring in the heart of the bride, which is come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. And he leaves us with a promise of grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Isn't that an awesome book? So we're done with the book of Revelation. Um, again, there's a lot in there, a lot of themes, a lot of truth. I mean, all truth. Maybe not what I share, but what's in the book for sure. I've shared with you uh, my heart. You know, I, I've shared with you where I feel confident, where I have uncertainty, and uh, where I'm learning and growing. Um, I've shared with you major themes in the book. But I hope that, uh, you know, in the end, what, what you come away with more than anything else is just a heart and a love and a desire for a greater relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. To see what he's done to save us, to see what it's like in heaven as he's standing there at the throne, seated at the throne as the, as the Lamb of God and, and uh, the millions and millions and millions of angels that are falling down to worship him. That he is the one, the only one worthy to open the seals. That the one who loves us is the one who judges us. 
It's not some God who's unconcerned. It's the one who died for us. He's the one. He's the one who calls us to repent. He's the one who calls us to open our ears to listen. He's the one who gives us these warnings. There's so many beautiful themes in here. But in the end, it's all about our relationship with Jesus. And I think as you see this thing all wrap up at the end, the dwelling place of God is with men. He took us from the beginning in the Garden of Eden, where we had access to God face to face, where we had access to the tree of life, all lost through the sin of mankind is finally restored through the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he puts us back where we were intended to be in the beginning. It's a beautiful love story. And you guys are living it out. You're part of it. And you have the opportunity to tell other people so they can partake of it as well. Because apart from that relationship with Jesus Christ, there is only eternal destruction in the lake of fire forever. Amen? So, Father, I thank you so much for your word, which is alive and true, life-giving. It is like a living water for us, Lord. We thirst after understanding. I thank you for the things that you revealed to your servant, John, in that day that would pass down to millions and millions of people throughout church history. And here we are today in this little town reading these same words, words that you spoke, words from your heart that we can hear and they can touch our hearts and change our lives. So, Father, I pray that we would be those who grow in, a, in our hunger to see you come again. And that hope for the future would drive each of us to want to be a holy man or a woman or a godly person. And, Lord, it would also drive us to greater uh, heart for evangelism as we understand <coughs> that there is only two destinies for mankind, one that is eternal with you and one that is eternity in the, in the lake of fire. I pray that we would see every human being on the premises of that decision and help us reach out to those who don't know you and help them to experience the wonderful thing that we have found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, my brothers and sisters, we're done.